it. Uh, I'm okay. I found it. But uh, when you, uh, you, you show me, right. Okay, How do I get them in alphabetical order? Um, you want to shop by name or by name? Yeah. By name, please wait. Okay. Okay. Can you please wait. Please wait. I shop by name, right? Yeah. Is it okay? Mm, oh my God. Okay. So what did you do? Okay. <laughs> Oh, what, what, did, what did I do? It's this one, right? Uh, uh, oh, I, I write this, I write it in the okay. voice pair and take the short by name. Short by name? Yeah. Oh, oh, where is that? Oh, it's straight, here, here, here. Uh, right take, right take the mouse, oh, right take, right, 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 here, right, right take the mouse, oh, here. Oh, sorry, sorry, here, here, the right space. Yeah, and short by. So, oh, okay. Here. It's, so, uh, look, 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 the second one, the second one, yeah, short by name. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, please. Is it okay? Yeah, that's right, I think. Yeah, because it's, it's in alphabetical order. Mm. Oh, oh, no, it's not. Is it, is it, too, it's is it too dark, right? I, I, I can tune the no, screen right. to light. Yes, it's in reverse order, I think. Mm. <laughs> well, I've lost it. It's DLS, right? Sorry? Is it the DLS? Yeah, right? DLS, yeah. So, all right. Finish, finish. Finish, finish. Finish, ไอเกียโอมาโตเทมไว้ไม่เอาเอาเนี่ยสุดเลยนี่ไม่ได้อัลเฟอร์เบติกโลนี่อ่าเอ็นเอชเอนเอเซนเดียโอเคพี่ใ
when I teach, I normally classify what I'm talking about into three categories. So this uh, <coughs> can warn you about how attentive you should be. When I say must know, that means you should be awake because that's what might come up in the exam. So, I mean, hands up everybody. Who's not interested in passing the exam? So I presume, because nobody put the hand up, you're all interested in passing the exam. Good, well done. Okay, so when I say must know, make sure you're awake, okay? Um, and then there will be um, should know, should know is for those who want to become, uh, get first class honours. And then might like to know, uh, for those of you who might go on to other courses, or who might enter politics, or want to benefit society generally. Okay, all right? <coughs> so, when I say must know, must know case names, must know certain statutory provisions, <coughs> and certain definitions. Now, definitions, when I talk about definitions, I sound like a kindergarten teacher. <coughs> but yes, these definitions are the key to passing the exam. And in contract law, there are, I think, six must-know definitions. Six must-know definitions, okay? Now, your job as a law student, and indeed as a lawyer, what is your main skill, that is, identify issues? Now, what is an issue? Tissue without the T? No. Don't like that one, right? An issue is a question for the court to decide. So when you go to court, the court will say, well, why are you here? What is the issue? <clears throat> okay, what is the legal issue? So the court then will look at the arguments for and the argument against, and guess what the judge does? He judges. <clears throat> he comes to a decision that based on what evidence has been presented. Okay? So make sure you look at, don't approach law like it's um, mathematics. It's not x equals 4, it is what is the issue, okay? <clears throat> and of course that means there should be a question mark, all right? <clears throat> so it's right, I'm blinded by that. Hello? And, oh my goodness, I have to put your glasses on, really. Okay. So, you've got the course manual, and we will be covering the course manual in contract law pretty well according to the chronological order in the course manual. So tonight we're on chapter one, okay? And, but when we come to the talk part of the course, I want to switch the order of topics slightly. You find that's mentioned in the PowerPoints, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and the reason why I switch the order of topics in tort law, I'll explain later on, okay? <coughs> now my PowerPoints are good, but no such thing as a perfect PowerPoint which means I do change my PowerPoints from time to time, okay? So have your pens ready. Oh, he's changed that one. Well, if I change it, it's for the better, because I'm looking at these things from your point of view as a student, okay? All right. <clears throat> so tonight we're going to be looking at formation of a contract. Now, you're all law students, so what are you working with? Words and the legal meaning of words. So you should all have a legal dictionary at home somewhere, okay? I've got three legal dictionaries. And I plant them all over my flat. So they go, oh my goodness, what does that mean? I can look it up. Okay. All right. So it's a bit like some people have three smartphones, you know, one for there, one for there. You should have three. I, I don't suggest you get three legal dictionaries, but I'm emphasizing how important it is. Okay. Because a lot of the law you study, the wording is from either. Latin or French. Why? Because England was a colony of Rome for 400 years and then a colony of France for about 150 years. So we have a lot of Latin and French words. So what does contract mean? Con means together, like we have convened. Been means come. So we have come together. That's what convene means. What does contract mean? Well, we'll look at this in a moment. Con means together. Trahere is a French word meaning draw. So <clears throat> contract literally means drawing together. And you'll see the first essential element in the formation of a contract is agreement. <clears throat> okay? All right? 
And how do you know when there's agreement? Well, you shake hands, except you're not supposed to shake hands these days. Buff elbow. It's not very friendly, buff elbow. Ouch, you've got sharp elbow. All right, so we're looking at formation of a contract, and chapter one we're dealing with the elements, the essential elements of the formation of a contract. Agreement, consideration, intention to create legal relations. What's consideration? Well, consideration, <coughs> uh, the easiest definition is reciprocal benefit and burden. Okay, so your name's? Yuko. Yuko, uh, I want to buy your smartphone. How much? Ten thousand cents. Okay, good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> with regard to consideration, it's reciprocal benefit and burden. So, I get the benefit of the phone, you get the benefit of my money, but it's reciprocal. <clears throat> I have the burden of losing money, you have the burden of losing your phone. Okay? So, that's what consideration is. It's a necessary element to show that the parties are serious. Okay? All right. <clears throat> So I'll be looking at consideration, not tonight, we'll deal with that next time we meet, okay? Tonight we're going to focus mainly on the first essential element in the formation of a contract, that is agreement, okay? Good. And there will be some must-know cases, and must-know definitions, and must-know principles, okay? Good. So that's our program, and as I say, you've got the course manual, the contract manual, as I say, is about 100 pages too long. Um, and 100 pages, I'll point out why it's not relevant to the course. <coughs> uh, right at the bottom, by the way, there's a very, very good recommended text for this course. Written by a really famous person. <laughs> and someone else. <laughs> yeah, because I used to be full-time Hong Kong U. And I was lecturing contract law. And when I was... I have papers all over. I said, wouldn't it be nice to just have one book on So I got together with Mick Fisher, sat down over a coffee, and in three minutes we decided, okay, 16 chapters, you do those eight, you do those eight, and that's it, we got on with it. So it came out, and the main aim of my book, our book, is to make it student-friendly. There's nothing worse than picking up a textbook, number one, which is so damn heavy you can hardly manipulate it, and number two, you're reading it, it's got all these footnotes and things, okay, uh, so we wanted to make it student friendly and it, so if you want a good textbook on contract law well available in every reputable bookshop in Hong Kong also online I think okay very reasonable price and it's in its third edition now so that's pretty good all right <coughs> and then uh, <coughs> so that's the textbook so the textbook is good for expanding on some of the points we talk about, which may not be covered in your course manual. Okay, course manual though is pretty good. It covers most things pretty well. I didn't write the course manual. Okay. So let's move on. Okay. So formation of a contract. So this is our overview. You are. Okay, so contract, you all know what it is. So somebody says, <coughs> you're studying contract. Well, what's the contract? Well, literally means drawing together. Yeah. How? Okay, by the way, what does the word taught mean? When we get to it. Taught means twist. Okay, so something's gone wrong, so you've got to make it right. Okay. And... <coughs> So when I crack my jokes and you screw up your face, you are contorting your face because it's painful. Right. Um, and we'll look at the similarities and differences between contract and tort uh, soon. Okay. Uh, <coughs> one major difference is that contract duties are in the contract itself, whereas tort duties are fixed by law, okay? And also, with regard to contract, you can sue for breach of contract. Somebody's not <coughs> sticking to the terms of the contract. So BCT is breach of contract. 
And also, in contract law, you don't have to prove somebody's at fault. If they haven't performed their duty under the contract, you can sue, sue them for breach of contract. Whereas in uh, tort law, particularly the tort of negligence, it is fault-based. Somebody is at fault. Okay. <clears throat> And also, we'll look at the remedies for breach of contract. The main remedies for breach of contract will be damages. <coughs> and damages is a remedy at law. Now, when you're studying contract law and tort law, particularly contract law, be aware of the distinction between being at law and in equity. You do need to appreciate the difference, okay? Because if you go along to any court at the moment, at any one time the court will be either wearing its legal hat at law or its equitable hat in equity. Why the difference and what is the difference? Well, the difference arose that in England in the Middle Ages, uh, the rules of, rules of uh, law were quite strict and inflexible, often resulted in injustice. So people were not happy. So who do you complain to? The king or queen, okay? The kid, oh yeah, I think you've got a good argument. I'd go and talk to my man of religion, the Lord Chancellor. And whatever he decides, well, that will be it. Okay? And so the Chancery Division of the High Court arose in England. And they developed their own rules in equity called the Maxims of Equity. I'm always waiting for somebody to come late because the first maxim of equity is delay defeats. Equity. Okay. Another maxim of equity was he who seeks equity must do equity. In other words, the clean hands doctrine. Oh, I've got it, hold up. The clean hands doctrine is a rule in equity. If you're seeking an equitable remedy, you have to act equitably yourself. Okay, the so called clean hands doctrine. They're the two main maxims in equity. Okay. <coughs> so, in England, actually had two separate buildings, the, the law building and the equity building. And then governments being governments, oh, this is a bit waste of taxpayers' money, so they put it onto one building, and then they had the Judicature Act, which <coughs> meant that you only had the one building, if you like. But at any one time, the court will be exercising its legal jurisdiction or its equitable jurisdiction. Watch out for that, because you do need to appreciate the difference between the two. <coughs> Okay. And damages is a remedy at law. What are the remedies in equity? Well, a <coughs> good question. Now, the point about equity is flexibility. And the idea of flexibility is try to achieve justice on the facts of a particular case. So the good thing about equity is it's fair. You come up with a just decision, but at the expense of certainty because nobody knows the result till you go to court okay and the main remedies in equity are an injunction and specific performance which are what court orders so the court makes an order for somebody to do something or not do something basically okay <clears throat> so the remedies are different at law and in equity and we'll be looking at remedies right at the uh, at the end. I haven't actually got remedies on the screen, but anyway. And then uh, contract formation, that's what we're going to deal with today. And when you deal with your assignment, you got the assignment question yet? You have. Okay, I think the assignment, the first question is a contract law question dealing with formation of a contract. And I'll tell you how you start off the perfect answer. Are you ready? so-and-so would like to know if there's a contract between him and the other person, whoever they are, okay? Full stop. Next sentence, the court will look for essential elements in the formation of a contract. Colon, agreement, consideration, intention, certainty, and no illegality. Don't worry too much about the last two. The first three, though, are very important. And in your assignment question one, the only element in issue will be the element of agreement. So I've given you the first three sentences of the perfect answer to your assignment question one. Okay?
And you've got to have good exam technique in tackling law questions. And to come up with a good answer to a law question, use the wording of the question, okay? So if I were to ask, uh, ask to advise Yuki, Yuki would like to know what? Whether there is a contract between her and whoever it is. Okay, we'll stop. And then you would say, the court will look for essential elements in the formation of a contract, agreement, consideration, intention, etc. We'll stop. And then the only element and issue in your uh, assignment will be the element of agreement. Okay, good. And then <clears throat> we'll look at the principles and definitions associated with an agreement. How do you know whether there's an agreement? Good question. Okay, good. Actually, I haven't given a face-to-face -face lecture for about a year. Okay, I've given mixed mode, but mixed mode I'm always looking at my screen and trying to figure out how Adobe Connect works. I've given about 60 of those, <laughs> right? Uh, anyway, uh, so it's trying to get used. I've got to have eye contact, for heaven's sake. I can't be looking at my screen all the time and ignoring it. And then I get blinded. Oh, no way. <laughs> all right, good. So there you are. We've got them on the screen. Then we're going to look at the uh, contents of the contract. So the first couple of lectures, we are looking at a contract being born. Then we're going to look, well, what is the what are the, uh, <clears throat> what's the contents of this contract? Then we're going to look at situations where the contract may go bad, inverted commas, those so-called vitiating elements. A vitiating element is something that makes a contract go bad. And they are things like misrepresentation, duress, undue influence, mistake, and under the unconscionable contracts ordinance, which we'll look at later. By the way, duress is a doctrine at law. Undue influence is a doctrine in equity. So there is a good example of where you need to appreciate the distinction between being at law and in equity. What's duress? Duress is, I've got a gun. I'll buy your, what have you got? I'll buy, oh my goodness, is that all yours? I'll buy all your electrical equipment, one Hong Kong dollar. You'll see that actually is a, um, you accept, right? I've got a gun. He said yes. So you'll find there'll be an agreement, there's consideration, but there may not, <coughs> so there could be a contract, but it can be made bad, if you like, made <coughs> voidable because of duress. Duress is a threat of physical violence. There's a more subtle form of duress called economic duress. We'll look at that later on as well. But duress is a doctrine at law. The equitable version is undue influence. Undue influence arises out of the relationship between two people. Now, you're all in relationships. I mean, teach a student, for heaven's sake. And you're all on Facebook or whatever. <coughs> relationships. Well, our relationships equal? Not usually. Well, he dominates in that area and I dominate in this area. So we're looking at this. So undue influence is where the dominant party <coughs> puts pressure on the weaker party to enter into a contract. But it's not a threat of shooting him in the head. It's not a threat of violence. Okay, it's a more subtle form of pressure. Okay. <coughs> All right, so look out for that when we get to... Uh, undue influence. And then we're going to look at the death of a contract. Termination of a contract. How can a contract terminate? The most common way is by performance. You enter into a contract, you perform your obligations, I pay Yuki her 10,000 cents, she pay, gives me the phone, contract terminate by performance. Most contracts terminate by performance. However, there are other ways of terminating a contract. You can terminate it by breach of contract, and if the other party accepts the breach, then that will terminate. One 
rider on that, though it has to be breach of an important term called a condition. Okay, we'll do that later. And then you can also terminate by agreement. You can agree to terminate early. And then last and important for you, you can also terminate agreement by frustration. What on earth is frustration? Frustra is a Latin word meaning in vain. Okay. <coughs> And frustration occurs when, without fault of either party, their contractual obligations have become either impossible, illegal, or radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. So you're not performing your obligation under a contract. No. So you're in breach. Yes. But I'm in breach because it's now impossible to perform. Okay. So that can terminate the contract. Okay. So that's frustration. All right, so that's a quick overview of the whole course. I like doing overviews, okay, or summaries. So it's like being in a helicopter overlooking the whole thing. Now we're going to come down to earth, unbuckle the seat belts, watch out for the rotor blades, and going to look at these in more detail, okay? Uh, in general, function of contract law, well, in contract, <coughs> the a key word is that you have a binding contract. <laughs> and if you have a binding <coughs> contract, another word is a valid contract, okay, then you can sue for breach of contract if the other party is not performing their obligations under the contract. So. If uh, I don't pay Yuki her 10,000 cents, she can sue me for breach of contract. If she doesn't give me her phone, is it the phone? I can sue her for breach of contract. Also, the idea of freedom of contract, and there's a Latin expression, consensus ad item, a meeting of the minds. Okay. So, that sounds well and good, but there are restrictions on this freedom of contract principle, and they are largely in legislation, which I've got on the screen. CECO, Control of Exemption Clauses Ordinance. We'll look at that a bit later, uh, when we look at uh, terms of a contract. What is an exemption clause? An exemption clause is just one clause in a contract, but it seeks to do a very big job. It seeks to act as a defence, well, because it tries to <coughs> restrict liability <coughs> or either breach of contract, misrepresentation, <coughs> or negligence. So it, it aims to do a very big job. So <coughs> an exemption clause, uh, one of the de must know definitions when we get to it, an exemption clause is one which seeks to exclude totally or restrict partially liability for either breach of contract, negligence, or misrepresentation. Okay. And usually, exemption clauses are put in contracts by suppliers. So they sell you, you know, a smartphone or whatever, and then you might find there's an exemption clause. We will not be liable if your phone catches fire and injures you, type of thing. Okay. Are those enforceable? Good question. Well, the law is... Uh, <coughs> usually quick to try and protect you and me against unscrupulous sellers of products, particularly ones that injure us or kill us. And so there are safeguards in place. An exemption clause will not be effective unless it passes three big tests. One will be <coughs> the exemption clause got to be in the contract. That's called incorporation in the contract. Number two, that the wording of the exemption clause covers whatever you're trying to exclude liability for. And number three, it will be caught by the control of exemption clauses ordinance. So the CECO is a form of consumer protection. And if the CECO applies, it renders an exemption clause either totally void, of no effect at all, or <coughs> makes it subject to a test called the reasonableness test. Okay. By the way, I use that word reasonable the word reasonable crops up quite often in law, and it's a very vague term. What do you think is reasonable? Do you think it's reasonable for drop my mask while I'm lecturing? Do you think it's reasonable to turn the air conditioning up so you don't go to sleep? 
And who decides what is reasonable? The answer is the judge in the particular case. And the law often is worded that way because they want the judge to look at the evidence and then they'll make a decision based on the evidence. So watch out for that word reasonable. Okay. <clears throat> and it's a very vague word and it's deliberate. Okay. Is the volume of my microphone reasonable? Good. Okay. Okay. Good. It's interesting. I talking about eye contact. With you all got masks on. That's about the only thing I can see. For your eyes. Hello. Well, we live in strange, stressful times, don't we? Good time to study contract law and tort law. You say, I'm glad I did that. I had time to do it because I couldn't go out and socialise. So I started reading my law books and look where it got me. You'll all be successful lawyers making plenty of money later. You'll be successful lawyers because you pass the exams. How are you going to pass the exams? By knowing the must-know definitions, must-know principles and must-know cases. So as we go through the course, draw up a list of must-know cases, must-know principles, must-know definitions, and I should also add in must-know legislation. Because as lawyers, what are your sources of law, cases, and legislation? Okay. Not much legislation in our course, but there is some. Okay. All right. Now, when it comes to case law, case law is interesting because there's a story there. So a case is a bit more interesting than legislation. problem with case law, of course, is what is the law that's laid down by this case? What is the ratio of the case? And the ratio of a case, finding the ratio, is more of an art than a science. Okay? You could say, well, the ratio is, you know, what is the issue that went to court? What are the material facts? What is the decision of the court? And then, if you're lucky, what is the reasoning of the judges? Okay? So case law is interesting, and we're going to look at some interesting cases. The problem with cases, though, is, well, what is the law? Delay, defeat, equity, got one. <laughs> Legislation, on the other hand, is boring. It's dull. You'll go to sleep, try to read it. I will navigate you through the legislation we cover. Look out for key words, okay? But legislation, everybody, is tough going, okay? It depends on when it's drafted. If it's been drafted more recently, the wording is a bit easier to follow, okay? But legislation is difficult. Um, but the only way to tackle legislation is to read it. And the advantage is, well, what you read is what the law is, okay? Okay. So the control of exemption clauses ordinance will deal with that when we deal with the contents of a contract because an exemption clause is just one of the terms in a contract. Okay. And then we're going to deal with the UCO, Unconscionable Contracts Ordinance. It's a very short ordinance, which was enacted in 1985 and it will be must know for you on the course. What does unconscionable mean? Good question. There is no definition. The court will look at various factors in deciding what is unconscionable, but again, it's a very vague sort of term as well. And there's no definition in the legislation. Okay. And then the EO, the EO employment ordinance, employment ordinance should know, not must know, but sometimes employment ordinance is relevant. Okay. Sociter, what's sociter? Supply of services, implied terms ordinance. So. One of the terms in a contract, well, what are the terms in a contract? Well, a contract can have expressed terms and it can have implied terms. So what are implied terms? Well, they are terms which are not actually expressed in the contract but will be implied under certain circumstances. They'll be implied because of a custom, they'll be implied by the courts in certain situations, and they can be implied by legislation. And such as the supply of services, implied terms, ordinance. So it deals with service contracts. So if you hire somebody to come and fix your air conditioner, then there will be terms implied into that contract. Number one, 
that the work is done to a reasonable standard, it's a reasonable price, etc. The word reasonable does crop up quite a bit. But, okay. And it was enacted mainly due to the uh, efforts of Christine Lowe, who's a prominent local legislator person. She was the driving force behind that. So that's supply of services. And then SOGO. What's SOGO? A store in... No! <laughs> supply of goods ordinance. And obviously this deals with contracts for the sale of goods. Okay? Which reminds me, when you're dealing with contract law issues, always be conscious of what is the subject matter of the contract. Because that will raise different issues. Is it a contract for provision of services? Is it a contract for sale of goods? Is it a contract for payment of a debt? What is it? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's some of the uh, legislation we'll be looking at. And the last bullet point, mainly consumer protection type legislation. Okay. There, there is other legislation we'll be looking at, but that's <coughs> the main part. Okay. Moving on. Role of the judge, remember, <coughs> the judge will look at precedent, so when he's deciding a particular case, if the facts are identical to a previous case, then he's bound by the doctrine of precedent to follow that case. So then you need to know what the ratio of the case is, okay? And then this word reasonableness, I've already mentioned. Whenever the word reasonableness is at issue, the person who judges reasonableness will be the judge. And then the role of equity, don't forget the equitable maxims, delay defeats equity, and he who seeks equity must do equity. Okay? So every time you're cleaning your hands, which you should do rather regularly, I probably haven't been doing it regularly enough. Why not? Because I've got a stomach bug. Okay. Um, I was thinking, uh, I got, got something, I don't know what it was. It's not something I ate, because the doctor said, did you eat raw fish? No. I said, it must be some sort of infection. Okay, and uh, it could be from... I'm okay, don't worry. I've lost a bit of weight, though. I'm a bit leaner than I used to be. But I said, hang on. I'm not going to cancel my first face-to-face -face class in 12 months just because of some silly bug. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I'm, a, I'm on medication. My stomach's not too bad. Okay. But I haven't eaten anything for about three days. Oh my goodness. But don't worry. I haven't had any coffee either. Coffee's caffeine, right? To keep you awake. And <clears throat> I don't need caffeine to get excited about contract law. No. Okay. Uh, also, this uh, ideas of fairness and unconscionability. Very vague words, okay? What is fair? Who knows, okay? And what is unconscionable? What on earth does that mean, okay? They are deliberately vague words, and that it is that way so that the judge can decide in a particular case. Which seems to so, say, hang on, aren't we giving the judge too much responsibility? Good question, okay? But judges are very experienced lawyers, okay? They've been around a long time. Hong Kong is a very proud judiciary. Oh, better not get political here. <laughs> Somebody's recording this, right? Okay. Delete any reference to politics. Okay. The reason why I got into law is because I used to be a tennis coach, and uh, some of my students were lawyers, in fact, high court judges. And they said, what are you going to do? You know, you can't be tennis coach all your life. Yeah, I like to do something with my brain. I already had a science degree. and says, well, why don't you uh, attend this uh, arbitration course? So I attended an arbitration course, wet weekend in February, and there was a little exam passed. I said, this law's pretty interesting. Said, oh, well, why don't you do a law degree? Oh, come on. Well, you can do it part-time in Hong Kong. So I did it part-time uh, sp through space. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> all right, so... There you are. Okay, everybody. What are the essential elements of the formation of a contract? Must know, must know, must know. This will be the second sentence in your perfect answer to your assignment question one. I'll talk about examination technique later with regard to your assignment and the <laughs> exam. 
But a good answer to a law question will have suitable subheadings. A suitable subheading would be an issue. For example, uh, well, in the, this set of PowerPoints, I've actually got the issues that perhaps you might want to put in your assignment question one. Okay? If you look at the end of these set of PowerPoints, I think it's there. All right? <coughs> also, in the exam, highlight your cases and legislation. Why? And how do you do that? Well, if you're typing it, bold print. In an exam where you use a pen, underline it. Okay? Why should you highlight your sources of law? Good question. Well, the answer is <coughs> to pay due respect to the source of law. Okay? And number two is the, the practical reason. The person who marks your exam, do you think he reads or she reads every word you write? I will not answer that question. But make sure they don't miss the fact you've identified this leading case by underlining it or putting it in bold print. Okay? But the main reason is to give due respect to the source of law. Generally, when you make an assertion, you should say, well, is there a legal reason? For what is the case that says this? What is the legislation that says this? Okay, good. Now, don't go to extremes. Some, some say, Mr. Greenman, can I double underline it, put Mickey Mouse ears on it? No. Simple underline will do, or bold print if you're typing. Okay? And by the way, if you do underline cases, don't do this, because it makes me dizzy reading it. Straight line, please. Okay. Right. And psychologically, it's really good in an exam, because in an exam, when you're underlining the leading case, Aha, uh -huh, he's not going to miss this. I've got the marks. I'm going to do well. Okay. So, yes, you, you should. I won't say must, but you should highlight your sources of law. Okay, Good. Okay. so they're the elements. <clears throat> and the only element at issue in your assignment question one will be the element of agreement. Okay. But there are other essential elements. Consideration we'll deal with next time we meet. Intention to create legal relations, that's an important one. The law distinguishes between domestic contracts and commercial contracts. In domestic contracts, there is a presumption that there is no intention to create legal relations. It's a rebuttable presumption, though. And in commercial contracts, there is a presumption of an intention to create legal relations. Again, a rebuttable presumption. So if you promise your loved one at home, I will wash up the dishes tonight and you don't do it, can they sue you for breach of contract? Well, they could, but they wouldn't succeed because there would be no intention to create legal relations. Okay. It is a rebuttable presumption though, if you say, put it in writing, I will wash up the dishes tonight. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then uh, capacity. Capacity refers to um, mental capacity and legal capacity. We're not really worried too much about mental capacity. Legal capacity means you've got to be age 18. Okay. And then certainty and form. Yes, obviously you can't have a contract where the wording is uncertain. Okay. Also, some contracts have to be in writing. Other contracts have to be by deed. Okay. So there, some contracts do require a certain level of formality. So that's what we talk about certainty and form. We're not too worried about the last two bullet <coughs> points on our course. Okay? But they are important in practice. And we will focus on the first three elements. Okay? All right. By the way, if I go over time, throw something at me. So I tend to have a break at eight o'clock, right? Ten minute break. Then I've got to decide what drink am I going to have. And oh, I've got my Gatorade. Hang on, let me. What about? Oh, I normally have it. At least I'm not coughing. That's good, isn't it? Nothing worse than listening to somebody who can't stop coughing. All right, where are we? Here's my saviour, everybody. 
pumpkin soup and Gatorade has kept me alive the last three days. Stay there. But I might have some chamomile tea. I believe that's good for upset stuff. Yeah, it might send me to sleep though. I don't know. Okay. Um, now, everybody, what's on the screen is extremely important. This is your first must-know principle, your first must-know case. And it's called Gibson and Manchester City Council. And in Gibson and the Manchester City Council, the court laid down the principle. How do you know where there is agreement? One of the essential elements in the formation of a contract. Well, the court said, and your course manual is a little bit weak on this, I must say. They sort of touch it a little on a little bit. But what's on the screen, everybody? My PowerPoint is it. Firstly, particularly the first PowerPoint. And the Gibson principle says this. The court will analyze the existence of agreement in terms of offer and acceptance. O is offer, A is acceptance. Unless there are exceptional circumstances. Unless there are exceptional circumstances. Now, must know the case name and must know the level of court, House of Lords. Why? Because in the Court of Appeal, the court came to the opposite conclusion. Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal said, this idea of looking for offer and acceptance is too simplistic, particularly in commercial contracts. And so Denning said, well, whether there's an agreement, let's see, have the parties agreed on the material terms? If they have, you've got agreement. Sounds like a reasonable argument. But he was overturned by the House of Lords who said, no, 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 the court will analyse the existence of agreement. By the way, I emphasise the existence of agreement, not contract, existence of agreement. In terms of offer and acceptance, yes, unless there are exceptional circumstances. So the court was giving sort of due deference to Denning by saying, unless there are exceptional circumstances. Okay? All right. Now, what are these exceptional circumstances? Well, probably the best example is Clark and Dunraven, which I don't think is in your course manual, but put Trentham and Lucifer, similar sort of case, but in Clark and Dunraven, there was a collision between two yachts. So one yacht owner sued the other yacht owner for breach of contract. But was there an agreement between the two yacht owners? Well, they'd never met. So how could there be offer and acceptance? And the court said, well, no, there is an agreement because they were both bound by the rules of the yacht club. Okay. So Clark and Dunraven is a good example of what we call exceptional circumstances. Okay, all right. And the others are less important cases. All right. Uh, Kalimpex is a Hong Kong first instance decision which says the same thing. But the must know principle. Must know is, and usually I get somebody to repeat it for me because it's so important, and highlight it one way or another. Okay. Your first must-know principle on this course is the Gibson principle. The court will analyze the existence of agreement. How? In terms of offer and acceptance. Good. Unless there are exceptional circumstances. So I should tape record that and keep playing it over and over again because that's very, very important. That is must-know. Must-know. Which begs the question, well, what is an offer and what is acceptance? Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> not defined in any statute or case law, but <clears throat> some textbooks touch on this a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> Tritle, for example, which is a very renowned book on contract law. <laughs> Tritle is a very difficult book to read, okay, but it has a definition something like this. An offer is an indication of a willingness to be bound on certain terms. An indication of a willingness to be bound on certain terms. 
Okay. Sorry, your name's Doris. I uh, I might buy your bag for a good price. Is that an offer? Indication orally. Willing to be bound. Might. Good price. Is that certain enough? No, that's not an offer. Okay, Doris. I will buy your bag, that one there, for 100 Hong Kong dollars. That's an offer. An indication orally, willing to be bound on certain terms. What terms are certain? The subject matter is certain, and the price is certain. Okay, good. And acceptance. Remember, <coughs> agreement, contract means meeting at the line. So acceptance means the acceptance must match the offer, so to speak. So let's say, Doris, I'm 100 Hong Kong dollars. What might you reply? It's okay. Did you hear that? $100. So from Shen Chu Pao. Well, if Doris upped the price to $1,000, is she accepting my offer? No. She would be making a counter offer. Okay. Uh, so acceptance must match the offer. So acceptance is final. No more negotiation. And unqualified. You don't change any of the terms. <coughs> Assent or agreement to the terms of the offer. Okay? So there are two must-know definitions and one principle we have covered tonight. <coughs> Aren't you glad you came? So when you go home tonight, in your mind, in your bag, you'll have one, well, at least two must-know definitions. And there are only six for contract, so that's pretty good. And one must-know principle. Now, these definitions and principles are really, really useful tools. Why? Because they help you identify issues. Okay? If you're doing a law question <coughs> and you can't identify the issue, or any issue, what should you do? Another question. There are always issues in the question. You've got to be able to identify them. What tools do you have to identify them? Definitions and principles. This is why they are must know. Okay? Must know. Now, tools are no good unless they are in good working order and you know how to use them. Okay? Good. Uh, I do a lot of hiking and in 2012 I did something stupid. I got stranded on top of a mountain and I was injured. Uh, I noted that I only had 20 minutes of sunlight left, daylight left. Why? Because I always know when the sun sets. What time is the sun set today? 5.38. So I said, you stupid idiot, you got yourself straight. What would a sensible person do? Call 999, call 999. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, where are you? I'm straight on. Don't panic. I wasn't panicking. Okay, so, uh, you know, 10 minutes later, in the back, was it top of Discovery Boat? In the road, two ambulances, two fire trucks. 14 guys started coming up the hill in pairs. And that, you should have seen how well equipped they were. My goodness. They were handsome guys, but look, they had long trousers, the boots, they, had pink pack. they couldn't get up to me. They kept falling down on top of the hill and swearing at me. Ah, gal, tall, ah, t sing, way low. Ah, so then I get a call on my phone. Hello, government flying service standing by. Yes, good. Okay. So they sent the helicopter. Another three guys. And then the rain was coming down. It was dark. And down comes the winks. Up I go. Okay. And then flew me to the airport. Another three guys patched up all my legs. And then I got really embarrassed. I said, okay, I'll walk home now, three miles. No, we'll give you a lift in the ambulance. So I got rescued by 20 guys and it cost me nothing. But these people had the gear, they had the equipment, they had the tools. They were in good working order. Thank God that winch was in good working order. And they knew how to use them, okay? So you've got tools on this course. You've got definitions and you've got principles. And yes, it's memory work, yes. But if you want to do well in the exam, know these definitions. And ju not just know them, know what they mean. Okay? Good. Enough about that. So what's on the screen, everybody? Must know, must know. Put a big circle around this one. This is a good one. 
uh, forms of offers, yes, you should appreciate that the distinction between a unilateral offer and a bilateral offer, what's the difference? Well, uni means one, lateral means side. Bi means two, so bilateral means two-sided. So my contract with Yuki is a bilateral contract. Why? Because we both make a promise. She promises to give me her smartphone. I promise to give her the money. Bilateral. Well, what is a unilateral offer then? It's where only one party makes a promise. Okay? And, for example, uh, the, the leading case on this is a case called Carlyle, which we'll look at after the break. But um, let's say, who could I choose? Oh, you look very athletic and fit. Some of your names. Alex. Okay. So, every, but I'll make it general. Everybody in this room, I offer 10,000 Hong Kong dollars to the first person to swim across Hong Kong Harbour from Hong Kong to Kowloon by 6 p.m. tomorrow. So Alex, you decide to accept my offer. Does he have to inform me? No, because it's an offer to the general public. So how do you accept a unilateral offer? By performing the required act. That's the important distinction. And the person who performs the required, is not making any promise, okay? So Alex, have you got uh, swimming trunks? No. Well, that could be wetsuit. No, no, okay. Goggle. No. Okay. What else? Flippers? No. Okay. So let's uh, say Alex goes and buys all these things. Has he started to perform the required act yet? No, he hasn't. You go down to the pier and you're about to jump in. Has he started to perform the required act? No. You then jump in. Breaststroke. Has he started to perform the required act? Yes, he has. And that's important because <coughs> you can't withdraw an offer once somebody started to perform the required act. Okay, but the nature of a unilateral <laughs> contract stroke offer is that only one party makes a promise. And how do you accept a unilateral offer? By performing the required act. And the other important thing is the person accepting the offer doesn't have to communicate acceptance. Okay? So be clear on the distinction between a unilateral contract and a bilateral contract. In a bilateral contract, you've got to communicate your acceptance. In a unilateral contract, you accept by performing the required act. Okay? All right. <coughs> How are we doing? Oh, not too bad. Maybe one more, we'll have a break. Yes. Also, we have to distinguish an offer from what we call an invitation to treat. What is an offer? An indication of a willingness to be bound on certain terms. But there may be, sort of like an advertisement, for example, that may, may not be an offer, it may be simply sales talk, an invitation for the other party to make an offer. Okay? So you do need to distinguish between an offer and an invitation to treat. How do you know the difference? Apply the definition of an offer. Indication of a willingness to be bound on certain terms. Okay? Right. And note at the bottom here, normally an offer must be communicated to the offeree. <coughs> you can't accept a unilateral offer unless you hear about it. There's got to be communication of the offer, always. Does there have to be communication of the acceptance? Not always, because it could be a unilateral offer. Okay, so we're talking about communication a, a fair bit shortly. And of course, the idea of a contract drawing together, there's got to be communication. Okay? But watch out for unilateral offers. And the leading case on unilateral offers, I thought I've already got it. No, it's a boots case. Oh, the Boots case, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, well, the distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat. Uh, the Boots case is an interesting one because Boots is a sold medicines and I'm taking some pills at the moment. Anyway, uh, <coughs> I'm not speaking gibberish, am I? Am I sounding logical? Good. Okay. <laughs> They're not mind-altering pills. Right. They're supposed to be stomach-altering. 
What happened in the Boots case? What, now, do you need to remember a year in which a case is decided? Normally, no. I ha Some of my colleagues disagree on this. Some say, yes, if you, they put down the year, they'll get an extra mark. But I think that's wrong. You should appreciate roughly when the case was decided because the surrounding conditions are, might be important. Now, 1953, self-service shops were a novelty. Okay. And by the way, with regard to quoting the year in an exam answer, uh, <coughs> when a case is decided, it may be decided in, say, 19, 2020, so, but not reported to 2022. So what year are you going to put down? 2020 or 2022? So, yes, appreciate roughly the time in which the case was decided, but I don't think there's a requirement to mention the year when you're doing exam answers. Remember the case name, yes. Okay. Remember the level of court where it's important, yes. Remember the year, not particularly. Okay. By the way, some students say, Mr. Greenwood, so I have to remember these case names. Yes. Why? Because that's your source of law. Okay. Well, what happens if the exam, I can't remember the case name? Well, you should have beforehand come up with some trick to help you remember the case name. How do you remember Gibson? Well, famous movie actor, or he was, star of Braveheart, Lethal Weapon 1, Lethal Weapon 2, 3, 4, Mel Gibson. Have you heard of him? You haven't heard of Mel Gibson? Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. I don't play. Well, if you go to, uh, does Netflix have old movies? I don't. I've resisted the temptation to get Netflix, otherwise you spend all your time watching movies, right? Um, but, you know, he was a famous movie actor, but then he fell out with the powers that be. But uh, anyway, but you've got to have some trick up your sleeve to remember case names. You are expected to remember case names. What happens if, do you remember, do you need to remember both names? If you can, but, I mean, Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain is a bit of a mouthful. He just remembers the Boots case. That would be good enough, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, case names are important, and the must-know case names I give you must know. Must know Gibson. Another, Boots is a should-know case. You know what I mean by should-know? Okay. And what is the ratio of Boots? Well, the court said the display of goods on the shelves of a self-service shop, the display is only an invitation to treat. It's not an offer. Why not an offer? Because if you go into a self-service shop and you're looking for your shampoo, or for me today, chicken broth, actually it tasted quite good as my lunch today, chicken broth. That's what I'm looking forward to tomorrow, my chicken broth for, for lunch. <laughs> okay. Um, well, if you pick that item up off the shelf, that could be construed as accepting the offer, if the display is an offer itself. Well, then you've got to go and pay for it. Well, in that case, nobody would go to those shops. Not very good for commercial reasons, is it? Okay. So for commercial, practical reasons, the court said the display of goods on the shelves of a self-service shop is only an invitation to treat. You pick up the item, then you make the offer, it's accepted by the cashier when you check out, okay? All right, so <clears throat> that's the Boots case. It's a good illustration of the distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat. How do you know whether a statement or notice is an offer? Apply your definition. An indication of a willingness to be bound on certain terms. Okay, now I think, does that take me up to? Uh, yes, takes me up to. The second must-know case, everybody, is the bottom one, Carlyll. Carlyll is a must-know case. But we won't have a look at that now. We shall have our short 10-minute break. After the 10-minute break, we'll come back and talk about the Carlyll case.
Okay, so uh, I hope you had a good little break. I've got my chamomile tea, so I feel safer now. Okay, so uh, what have we learned so far today? Well, quite a lot, okay? You have two must-know definitions. Offer and acceptance. Must-know, so my suggestion is write them down somewhere in your must-know list. There are six must-know definitions for contract law. Offer, acceptance, consideration next time we meet, we'll go through that. And then um, <coughs> exemption clause, misrepresentation, frustration. So by the end of our work on contract law, there will be six must-know definitions. And as I say, no apologies. I mean, it sounds a bit like you know, rote learning, but if you want to be an architect, you've got to learn how to lay bricks. What, what's the other one? <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay. Um, and they will be your friends. They will be the tools to help you build a good answer to an exam question. Your skill is to identify issues. How do you do it? Well, use your definitions and principles. Okay, so the definition of an offer, an indication, can be orally, can be in writing, can be a notice, can be advertisement, an indication of a willingness to be bound. By the way, in Gibson, uh, it concerned Mr. Gibson wanted to buy his council house, because I think in England you could rent it, but then like in Hong Kong, okay? Hong Kong got the home ownership scheme. So the sitting tenants were given the chance to buy their house. But the Manchester City Council said to Mr. Gibson, we may let you buy your property. Was that an offer? And the court said no. Because what's an offer? An indication of willingness to be bound on certain terms. Okay? So, you know, I may give you a million dollars is a hell of a lot different from I will give you a million dollars, okay? All right, so words are important. So the whole decision in Gibson centered around just one three-letter word, may, okay? <coughs> Good. Okay, so that's the definition of an offer. And we're going to look at that in more detail when we look at the Carlyle case in a moment. Acceptance final and unqualified assent to the terms of the offer. What happens if you change some of the terms, like the price? Well, that will be a counter offer. Okay? So, counter offer is the one that's on the table. Actually, yes, I'm going to do that later. <laughs> I'm glad I bought you. Good teaching. Eh? <clears throat> uh, let's talk quickly about Partridge and Crediton. Uh, Partridge was an advertisement for birds for sale at a stated price, but it was a criminal offence to do that. It was a criminal offence to sell birds, but was or, <coughs> or criminal offence to offer for sale. Okay, so was the uh, advertisement an offer or an invitation to treat? The court held it was only an invitation to treat because of lack of supply, because if you're advertising to the general public. You've only got 100 birds and 1,000 people apply. Well, you're, you can only satisfy 100. So for business sense, it was treated as an invitation to treat. Similarly, in Fisher and Bell, it was, I think, a, some sort of hunting knife in the window of a shop. It was illegal to offer such a knife for sale. Okay, but the court said it wasn't an offer. It was only an invitation to treat. Okay, so good. So look how useful your definition of an offer is. It helps explain those cases. Now, let's talk about Carlyle. Carlyle, interesting case, particularly in these days of COVID-19. Well, back in the 1893, there was a lot of flu going around. And the carbolic smoke ball company says, <coughs> uh, use our smoke ball, and if you catch the flu, we will pay you 100 pounds, which is a lot of money way back in the late 1800s. Now, Mrs. Carlyle accepted the offer. It was a unilateral offer, because Mrs. Carlyle didn't communicate her acceptance. She simply performed the required act. She used the smoke ball according to the instructions, so that was her performance, and she caught the flu. 
so she sued the, sm the smoke ball company for breach of contract. But was there an agreement? <coughs> was the advertisement an offer or just an invitation to treat? Well, the court said it was an offer. Why? An offer is, everybody, indication by advertisement, willing to be bound. Now, the court looked at the wording of the advertisement and they said, in order to show our sincerity, we have deposited £1,000 in the L.I. Dunbar Bank. They are serious. They are willing to be bound. Okay? On certain terms. Now, the defendant in Carlisle had a very good argument. They said, not all the terms are certain. In particular, what is the period for catching the flu and still being able to claim the reward? Is it while you're actually using the smoke ball? <coughs> during the period of the pandemic, or was it for a reasonable period afterwards? Well, the court said, well, it's either while you're actually using it for, or for a reasonable period after use. And what is reasonable is clear enough because we can bring in expert medical evidence to show us what that reasonable period would be, okay? Good argument, but it failed, okay? The court found it was certain enough, okay? So look how useful your definition of an offer is it explains a very famous case of Carlyle. The issue, the issue in Carlyle was that advertisement, an offer or an invitation to treat. So the court simply applied the definition of an offer. It was an indication by written advertisement. Willing to be bound from the wording in the advertisement and the fact they deposited money in the bank on certain terms, well, the court in the end found that all the terms were certain. Good case, Carlyle. Okay? Um, and Carlyle's, I'd say, a must know case because it's a good case on the unilateral offer. Okay? And I mean, it's uh, sort of topical today, isn't it? I wonder if Pfizer and Moderna are coming out with a smoke ball for COVID 19. It seems cap. Why would you smoke a smoke ball? You'd probably end up with tuberculosis instead. Anyway, that was the 19th century. Thank God we've got modern medicine, okay? And with modern medicine, uh, with modern advances in technology, um, there's a, two Turkish refugees have come up with these uh, new vaccines with uh, Pfizer and Moderna, I think it is, okay? And uh, they were kicked out of Turkey and they went to some other country and they, they helped develop this. It's interesting, famous people get kicked out of countries, they go to another country, and because they're able to uh, freely explore whatever they want to explore, they come up with these inventions, like Einstein. <laughs> Although the atomic bomb wasn't a great result, was it? But the theory of relativity. Anyway. anyway, I better not get political. <laughs> All right, okay. Sales of land, should know this, not must know. Obviously, when it comes to the subject matter, land is very valuable asset. So the courts are more strict, if you like, in interpreting whether there's actually a contract or not. A very old case of Harvey and Facey, a telegram indicating lowest price prepared to sell land that was held to be only an invitation to treat. Because land is such a valuable asset. And some contracts require a certain level of formality and normally with land it has to be in writing and with signature and quite often there must be even a requirement for execution by deed. Okay? Right. And also Gibson and Manchester City itself may be prepared to sell. Well, you know why that wasn't a contract because it wasn't an offer. May doesn't mean you're willing. Okay? And also because it's a contract for sale of land. The courts are very reluctant to find there's an enforceable contract dealing with land when there is this uncertainty, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Spencer and Harding, uh, again, is sort of an auction type case which we don't need to worry about, okay? But the general point, everybody, is when you're dealing with contract law issues, there are actually three things to note. Parties, property, price. Who are the parties? Are they individual persons or are they limited companies? The property, what is the subject matter of the contract, and the price. Okay. 
So they're normally the essential terms, and those three terms can uh, <coughs> lead to, well, guide you towards certain issues. Certain issues arise. Okay, uh, now the definition of acceptance. Acceptance is final and unqualified assent to the terms of the offer. You know that because I've mentioned it at least three times, maybe four. Okay. So I trust everybody. By this time, you've already written down the definition of offer and acceptance plus the Gibson principle. Well done. So when you go home tonight, and you talk to the person you're staying with. With me, it used to be the cockroaches. But <laughs> oh, actually, I'm not on my own now. I've, I've hired somebody to help me with. But I say, well, how did it go? Well, I'm not a student, but if I was a student, they say, well, was he any good? Did he teach you anything? Yes, I don't know the definition of offer and acceptance. Good, why is that important? Because of the Gibson principle. Well, you're talking about a movie star. No, it's good to talk about legal issues with other people because when you speak and you don't make sense, the other people will let you know. I mean, it's like that on social media. What? <laughs> no idea what you're saying. Well, then you've got to think again and come up with a better way of expressing yourself. Okay? So it's good to talk about legal issues with somebody who knows nothing about law, because then you've got to be clear. Okay? All right. <coughs> good. Okay, now, two cases here, and you'll notice I've got two letters there CF. What is CF? Contrast. It's contra, I'm not sure what the F stands for. <laughs> contra means contrast. Two cases, Hyde and Wrench, Contrast, Stevenson and McLean. Now, in Hyde and Wrench, there was an offer to sell property for 1,000. Actually, it's pounds, but my computer doesn't have the pound sign. I could probably find it if I looked hard enough. Okay. Uh, but the plaintiff replied, P is plaintiff, okay, uh, replied he would do so for $950. Is that acceptance? No because it's not final and unqualified, it's qualified. You have changed the price. Okay, good. Uh, by the way, when you're dealing with law issues too, remember, think about the court process. You go to court, so the plaintiff is suing the defendant, okay? And so there are arguments on both sides of the issue. So think of like that when you're handling examination questions, all right? And uh, when I was a practicing solicitor, I used to go, I was in the High Court a couple of times, and I remember one of the, actually he's my tennis student too, Gerald, but he's very, said, Mr. Greenwood, what's your argument? So you've got to be able to be very clear and concise. What is your argument? Okay. And what is your argument? And then, of course, evidence will be produced to support your argument. And then the judge will judge. Okay. So, also, when you're going through cases, sometimes it's useful to know who has the burden of proof. And the burden of proof is normally summed up in the expression, he who asserts, A-double-S-E-R-T-S, -S, he who asserts must prove. So if you're alleging breach of contract, you've got the burden of proving breach of contract. Okay? And in civil actions, the standard of proof is on the balance of probabilities. What do you mean by the balance of probabilities? More likely than not. Okay? Now, the court's not going to give you a figure, you know, 51%, 49 but it is a lower standard than the criminal standard of proof. The criminal standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. So it's a higher standard in criminal cases, all right? So it can quite often happen that evidence of a criminal conviction can be used as evidence in a civil action. And that's very strong evidence. The word that's often used is cogent evidence, C-O-G-E-N-T. Cogent evidence is really, really strong evidence, okay? So evidence of a relevant criminal conviction in a civil action is very cogent evidence. Okay. I remember I was uh, before a magistrate in Chan Chu Po, before they closed the magistracy. 
No, and, and I went in, yeah, one in front of a magistrate who's an Englishman, very strict. I'm not English, as I said to one of them. I'm Australian, but I've been in Hong Kong so long, I've lost my accent a bit. Um, why? Because when I first came to Hong Kong, nobody understood me. So I have to start speaking like an Englishman. <laughs> By the way, I think I've been in Hong Kong longer than just about anybody in this room. 45 years. I thought I'd last 18 months and I'm still here. <coughs> now I can't leave Hong Kong anyway. So <laughs> you know why. Yeah, no, Hong Kong's a great place. I mean, fantastic. I mean, Whenever you're down in Hong Kong, there's usually something to lift you up, like a helicopter. And then when you're down again, something to lift you up, like a job offer, okay? So, and Hong Kong people are great, okay? Some of my best friends were actually people from Hong Kong who emigrated to Sydney, and that's how I came to Hong Kong. Don't tell them their life story, you're supposed to be teaching contract law. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so, what am I talking about? I'm digressing. Yes, code you never, yeah. So I went before this magistrate and he said, uh, Mr. Green, I don't believe a word you say. Why? Because my evidence was only oral. I mean, that's a bit, you know, somebody said, don't believe anything. That's a bit of a, you know, that really knocks you down a bit. And then in another case, I turned up in court. I had all my papers lined up. I presented my evidence. Here's this first paper, then this paper. Mr. Greenwood, my goodness, how impressive. How long have you... Now, of course, that's not directly related to you on this course, but you should appreciate that when we're talking about these cases, they go to court, and so the, you need to know the adversarial system. It's plaintiff against the defendant. That's why it's the versus. It's like a fight, okay? And um, somebody's going to win, and the judge is the judge, or the referee, if you like, in the fight, okay? And, uh, you know, can be quite brutal at times, the adversarial system, but it works because the idea is to come up with, if you like, the true result. Okay. All right. By the way, when you say a case name, it's not hide the wrench. It's hide and wrench. That's what lawyers say. The case is hide and wrench. In America, they say hide versus wrench. I think I actually do say that. Anyway. But, you know. The proper way of saying it is hide and wrench. Right. So in hide and wrench, that was only a counter offer. Why not? Because what is an uh, acceptance? Final and unqualified assent to the terms of the offer. Stevenson McLean, though, went the other way. That's why it's CF contrast, where there's a reply to an offer, but it's only by way of inquiry. It did not amount to a counter offer. In other words, they're asking for a bit of an explanation of of the offer itself. Okay, okay so watch out. Hide and wrench, I think, is probably a must-know case. It could come up exams. And it's always good to remember cases in contrasting pairs. Why? Because when you have an issue, there's an argument for, and there's an argument against. So is it hide and wrench, or is it stevenson McLean? Good to remember cases in contrasting pairs, because then you've got both arguments covered. Okay? By the way, what happens if you Doing an exam question, there is an issue, okay, and it's not clear, you know, which is the stronger argument. Well, then you might have to use a magic two letter word. And that magic two letter word is if. If. This is the argument, okay. If not, then it's something else. Um, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. I can, prop, I can do this, because yeah, now we're face to face. Now, have I got the pens? Now we're sort of going back in the stowed age of teaching. <laughs> oh, here we have pens. I'm not sure where you can see this, but this is, this is how you tackle exam questions. So let's say you're in an exam, and the main issue, well, is in your assignment question one. And the issue, is there a, a contract between A and B, all right? So, of course, you write down all the elements of a contract, you find that the only element in issue is agreement. Well then of course you start off with Gibson. Gibson gives us the general principle. The courts will analyze the existence of agreement in terms of offer and acceptance unless there are exceptional circumstances. 
in your assignment question one, there will be no exceptional circumstances. So you will have to look out for an offer, has it been communicated? You will have to look out for an acceptance, has it been communicated? Okay, so we go up here. So that could be the first issue. Is a statement made, an offer, or an invitation to treat? And then you might go on to another issue. Is there acceptance, or is there a counter offer? Okay. So that looks a little bit like what? A tree, right? Got nothing to do with my name. A tree. Look more. So in an exam question, your main aim is to identify issues, argue both sides, but everybody, examination technique means come to a decision which enables you to carry on your answer. Okay? And use your magic two-letter word, if. And normally the more issues you can identify, the taller your tree grows, which means the more fruit the tree produces in the form of marks to you. Okay? All right. So, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> I suppose I could turn on the lights. You can have a look at that at the break if you like. Get up and take a, a photo. <laughs> I'm blinded there and I can't see over here. All right, how are we going for time? Oh, not bad. So everybody, what's on the screen? Yes, must know. I would say you've got the definition of acceptance. You've got two cases which touch on that issue. Okay. <clears throat> so remember, your main task as a lawyer is to identify issues. It's like a well-known person in America who is going to court on a lot of occasions trying to argue there's an issue and the court is saying, rubbish, there is no issue here, go away. You know who I'm talking about, right? Somebody who doesn't like losing elections. Okay. I said, there's no legal issue here, go away. Or there's no evidence to support. Thank you, Doug. So when does acceptance take effect? Must know the Intore's <coughs> case. Acceptance is not effective unless communicated to the offeror. Entores is a very famous must know case. In Entores, it was one person on the side of a river and he wanted to shout his acceptance of an offer. He started to shout his acceptance, but a plane threw overhead. He knew the other person hadn't heard him. Was there agreement? The court said no. You had to wait for the plane to fly away and then shout his uh, acceptance again. When he did shout his acceptance, then you've got your agreement, got your contract, okay? So that's what Entores is all about. It's a decision by Lord Denning. Now, Lord Denning's a famous English judge, particularly in the area of contract law. And by the way, Lord Denning is famous for having writing judgments with quite short sentences, okay? Uh, this is part of examination technique. In your exam answers, be aware of structure. Your answer should not be like some of the exam papers I've been marking lately, in which there is absolutely no structure, no paragraphs, and very long sentences. They drive me mad. I have to get up and walk around and say, oh my goodness. Okay. okay. I have actually marked a paper in which there were no paragraphs at all. Paragraphs are good, okay? And subheadings are good. Why? Because subheadings let you focus on what you're writing about and the person marking your paper knows what you're writing about, okay? So keep your paragraphs generally quite short. Keep your sentences generally quite short, okay? Uh, so if I start a sentence and I start to deviate into other issues which were not connected with what I was talking about at the beginning and then I start to talk about something else which I hadn't mentioned before but I thought I should mention it you've lost me, I've lost you keep your sentences relatively short I'm not saying every sentence should be three words long <laughs> okay. there is common sense by the way, do you single space or double space your answers? well that's up to you I prefer single spacing. Why? 
because it's easier to focus on one page than two pages. And when I was a, uh, a practicing lawyer in court, uh, one of the best pieces of advice from another friend of mine, uh, who was a high court judge too, when I applied to be a trainee, said, now, you seem to be well connected with the judiciary. Anyway, they got me interested in the law. Okay, So I went from the tennis court to the law court. Joke. Anyway. Yeah. He said, when you're presenting your eye, have it all on one sheet of paper, and then you can focus on your points. So when I was practicing, well, I actually practiced criminal law for a while, I had all my arguments on one sheet of paper in headings, etc. And then it's much easier to concentrate and focus on those than if you're spread out all over the place. Okay, So generally it's better to keep your work more compact than spread it out. Okay. So I suggest single space your answers, but leave a gap between paragraphs. That's a good compromise. Okay. So structure is important. Okay. Oh, by the way, to this, a little bit. Make sure you let the examiner know exactly what question you're answering. Uh, I spent a sleepless night. I couldn't figure out what question this student was answering because he wasn't answering the question which he had numbered, seven or whatever it was, and he seemed to be answering a question from another paper. Uh, so I, I, had to, I gave up. I said, sorry, I'm unable to mark this question. I really don't know what question he's answering. Okay. And it's not the one he marked, and it doesn't seem that the other mark, the other alternative he might have done. Okay. So be very clear on what question you're answering. I mean, it seems such common sense, but there you are. Exam technique is important. Okay, I'm going to talk about that a bit more later. All right, so <coughs> there you are. So in Torres and Miles, must know case, everybody. And I'm going to come, I'm coming up to a second must know principle soon. Uh, silence is never acceptance. That's normally the case. That's a case of Felthaus and Binley. You can't say, I will offer to sell something to you. If I don't hear from you by a certain time, I'll assume you've accepted. That's not acceptance. Uh, that's covered in your course manual. Um, I've got a copy of the new course. I think it's the old course manual. It's just got different, a newer cover. And what I'm a bit wary of is that whether the pages in my book are the same as in your book. Okay? Uh, if not, they'll be. What I've attempted to do, you'll notice in my PowerPoints, I've got numbers 142. So that corresponds with 142 in your course manual. Okay? Uh, <coughs> For example, uh, Carlil is mentioned in your course manual on page 16, Partridge and Crittenden 15, Fisher and Bell 13, Carlil 16. Okay. Right. Felthaus and Bindley's on page 22. And if I were you, as I go through the must-know cases, get out your favourite colour highlighter and highlight the must-know case. As I say, the course manual is a little bit weak on Gibson. The Gibson principle should have been spelt out a bit more clearly. But you know what the Gibson principle is, don't you? The court will analyse the existence of agreements how? In terms of offer and acceptance. All the time? Unless there are exceptional circumstances. Must know. Okay. Must know. Not say, so, oh, I heard of it somewhere. No, not good enough. You've got to know it inside out, back to front, upside down. So if you haven't a bit like me, haven't eaten anything for three days, haven't, well actually I've slept all right. <laughs> uh, if you haven't had any water for two days, I've had plenty of water, you should still be able to say without hesitation, deviation or repetition, the Gibson principle. This is why some students avoid me when I pass them in the street. Oh no, he's going to ask me the Gibson principle. <laughs> well, you should, Mr. Greenwood, I know it, what is it? the court will analyse the existence of agreement in terms of offer and acceptance, unless there are exceptional circumstances. Said what court? House of Lords. 
Watt case, Gibson and Manchester City Council. Is the level of court important? Yes, it is. Why? Because the Court of Appeal came to the opposite conclusion. So you'll get extra marks in the exam if you mention House of Lords. Okay? And in your assignment, question one, if you, don't, if you mention Gibson, you'll probably pass. If you don't mention Gibson, you'll probably fail. It's the bedrock of your answer. Okay? And, we, you're, and the reason is because uh, I'll flip through very quickly right to this bottom one. Ta-da! This is how you answer questions on formation of a contract, particularly when the only element in issue is agreement. What do you start off with? Do you state the Gibson principle first? Because that sets it up for you. Because then you have to identify, is there an offer? Has it been communicated to the offeror? Is there acceptance? Has that been communicated to the offeror before withdrawal? Uh, before withdrawal, we're going to cover, cover that soon, but when you make an offer, here's my offer, on the table, I can withdraw my offer any time before acceptance. So uh, perhaps, gentlemen, sorry, your name, second row. Tom. Tom? Tommy. Tommy, here's my offer on the table. Now, to accept my offer, Tommy will come out to the table and pick up the bottle. Are you ready, Tommy? Here he comes. But remember, I can withdraw my offer any time before acceptance. One more time, one more time. <laughs> Here's my offer on the table, but I can withdraw it any time before acceptance. And <laughs> too late, I can't withdraw my offer anymore. Okay. Give me back my bottle. Okay. Well done, Tommy. Thank you very much. I know. When you go along to a lecture, you just want to sit down and absorb things. All right, fine. Go to sleep, maybe fine. Not asleep, okay. But, you know, um, some of these points, by doing things, it illustrates the point a bit better. Okay? Good. Mm. So there it is. That's how you answer it. And, of course, we haven't quite covered particularly uh, the last point. We're coming there. Okay? But that's where we're heading. And sometimes it's good to look ahead and see where we're going to end up. So this is a very important PowerPoint. Okay, but now I've got to go back. And, um, so that's Entores. Uh, but there are exceptions to the Entores point. And the exception, of course, we already know. You can accept a unilateral offer by performance. You don't have to communicate your acceptance because the offeror has waived the need to communicate. Watch out for that legal word, waive. Waive is with an I in the middle. You give up or forfeit, okay? So look up that in your legal dictionary, okay? And also, you can accept an offer by conduct. That's possible as well. Uh, I think that's more should know than must know for our purposes. But, you know, by the court will look at the facts, and if you've actually done something which effectively means you've accepted the offer, then that will be good enough too. Uh, at the bottom, I have what we call the postal rule in inverted commas. The postal rule is an exception to the Entores principle because the postal rule says this, it's very out of date, but the examiners love it. The postal rule says that acceptance is effective as soon as you put your letter in the control of the post office. That's the postal rule. We're going to come to that in a moment, but it's important to put the postal rule in its place. It's not a rule itself, it's an exception to the general principle. And what is the general principle? Acceptance must be actually communicated to the offeror, entores, unless it is a unilateral offer, because in a unilateral offer, acceptance is by performing the required act, okay? Or, if the postal rule, 
applies. Okay. So what's on the screen, everybody? Must know, must know, must know. Our second must know principle for tonight. So we do need to look at the postal rule, though, because it is must know for the exam. It could come up. In your exam, it, there's part A, part B. Part A, there are five questions carrying 20 marks. You do three. So that's 60 marks for part A. Part B, two questions carrying 40 marks. But you only do one, so that's the other 40. And the two questions in part B, one will be a contract question, one will be a taught question. By the way, some students say, oh, that's good. I mean, I only need to study the contract part of the course to pass. That's a mistake. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So what's on the screen, everybody? Must know, must know. Our second must know principle for tonight. What's our first must know principle? The Gibson principle. The court will analyze the existence of agreement in terms of often acceptance. All the time? unless there are exceptional circumstances. Said what court? House of Lords. What case? Gibson. Okay, good. I know uh, some of you are saying, Mr. Greenwood, you're talking a bit too fast, and I appreciate that. Okay. Um, but, but I get so excited, it's hard to slow down when you're excited. Uh, but when we come to the important points, you'll get it, okay? And if you don't remember the Gibson principle, everybody, I'll give up tear my hair out. What else? Bang my head against the wall. Swim across Hong Kong Harbour. <laughs> All right, okay. Must know, must know. Okay. As I say, it is memory work, yes, but it's absolutely necessary memory work, yes, and you'll be glad you've got these tools when you're in the exam because generally the second line of your answer will be a definition or principle. And that sets up your answer quite nicely. Okay? Good. So they are your friends to guide you to examination success. Okay? And friends are good. Friends will help you. Okay? All right. Good. But remember, tools, friends, should we equate a friend with a tool? No. But tools are no good unless they're in good working order and you know how to use them. Okay? Good. Remember in Carlisle? Was that advertisement an offer or an invitation to treat? Well, apply your definition. Indication? Yep. Yeah. How? Written. Willing to be bound? Yes. Because they said they were serious. How do you know? Because they used the word in order to show our sincerity. And they deposited money in the bank. And then, of course, <coughs> on certain terms, good argument. By the way, what does the word sincere mean? That's a good one. Uh, one of my favorite websites is Eti Moline, E-T-Y-M-O-L-I-N-E. -E. In Eti Moline, it gives you the derivation of words. So what does sincere mean? Sin means without. Serie means wax, W-A-X. So why is sincere without wax? So it's because in Roman times, when they put up their buildings, they had to write at the side of the building, sincere, this building has been constructed and the concrete doesn't contain any wax. Because if it contained wax, the building would collapse. Now you know. Sincere means without wax. So when I used to drive in, I haven't got a car at the moment. The insurance company said, Mr. Greenwood, your car's so old, it's now a classic. Well, oh, okay. But now you're not allowed to drive it more than a certain number of kilometers a year. So what's the point of having a car if I can't use it? So I haven't had a car for three months. But when I used to drive my car in, I used to, from Tung Chung, the only time I stop is when I'm in Hong Kong because of traffic jams. So I used to, and on the right hand side, sincere building. I said, well, I hope so. In fact, I hope every building in Hong Kong is sincere. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Okay. Actually, one student sent me an email once. And he said, hello, Mr. Green, and then he signed up. Yours without wax. No, OK, good. So there you go. Just thought I'd throw that one in. I mean, because you, you're law students. You're dealing with words and the legal meaning of words, OK? And contract now, I hope, sounds a bit more interesting. It means drawing together. That's why we've got offer and acceptance. Taught means twist. Something's gone out of shape, such as you're in a traffic accident and you get boosted up, OK? Um, and then now we've got, well, since, anyway. 
thinner. So what's on the screen? Everybody must know, must know. Put a big circle around this PowerPoint, must know. And what about the exceptions? Well, we know the first exception, but what about the second one? What is the postal rule? Well, we'll come to that. I want to go into it now. Oh, I'm going to come back to the others. The postal rule, everybody, is must know. And if it comes up in the exam, it'll probably be in part A of the exam. Possibly part B, but I'd say part A, so it's a 20 mark question. And it's not difficult once you know. And you always say, what is the postal rule? The postal rule means that as soon as you accept, put your letter of acceptance in the mail or in the control of the post office, that is effective acceptance. Okay? But there are limitations. And the, the must know case is Adams and Linzel. Adams and Linzel. How do you remember the case name Adams? I used to remember because that was uh, David Beckham's wife's maiden name. Posh. Was she Posh? Posh Spice. Forget her first name, but Adams. Okay. Well, I mean, okay, that's it. Uh, but by the way, uh, English cases are a little bit boring, aren't they? You know, Smith and Jones, Adam. Hong Kong cases are much more interesting because Hong Kong cases have, uh, well, when we come to them later. Right? All right, so there you are. Adams and Lintzel must know case. What does it say? Acceptance is effective as soon as you put your letter in the control of the post office. Okay? But it only applies to acceptances. It doesn't apply to offers. It doesn't apply to counter offices. Offers, okay. And it's only when it is reasonable to use the post. Henthorne and Fraser. So if the offer comes by telephone, uh, by text message, is it reasonable to reply by post? The answer would be no, because that's a much slower method than the original offer. Okay. Uh, and why do we have the postal rule then? Good question. Well, the justification is that the courts say that the parties treat the post office as their agent. Okay, so as soon as you put it in control of your agent, that's basically it. Okay. The other rationale is business certainty. You know as soon as you put your letter in the control of the post office, which normally means putting in the mailbox, you have an enforceable contract and you can get on performing your obligations under the contract. So if you have to, say, produce a certain number of items by a certain time, you know you can start working right away. Okay. But it is an anomaly, it is obsolete, but it does come up in exams. It's an exception to the general principle that acceptance must be actually communicated to the offeror. Okay? And it does not apply to anything except acceptances. And it doesn't apply when the terms of the offer either expressly or impliedly indicate that the offeror wants actual communication. Such as in Holwell Securities and Hughes, in which I think the wording of the offer said, anybody wishing to accept their offer, please let me know. Well, that ruled out the postal rule. Okay? By the way, um, Adams, Henthorne, and Household Fire, all on page 23. And um, Holwell Securities on page 24. So it's very easy to rule out the postal rule. All you've got to say is put wording, suitable wording in the offer to rule it out. Okay? But examiners love testing you on the postal rule. But put the postal rule in its place. It's not really a rule. It's an exception to the general principle that acceptance must be actually communicated to the offeror. Okay? Uh, Crenadine and coal, don't worry too much about. Um, it's, it's sort of similar to whole world securities. It was um, implied or it was clear from the wording of the offer that 
uh, acceptance by post was not acceptable. So I'd say whole world security is a should know, bordering or must know case. So that's the general principle. Now I want to get into a slightly complicated area on acceptance and the method of acceptance. Not too bad, but it does come from the general principle that the person who makes the offer is the master of the offer. I can attach conditions to the offer. And those cases on the screen, I don't think they're in your course manual, but maybe they should be. I'll just check. Hello, are you there? Yes, Manchester's mentioned on page 24. Yates and Pauline isn't, but says the same thing. So that's an important point to make. The person who makes the offer can attach conditions. And if the offerer insists on a particular method, then that's the only method that can be used to accept the offer. However, if the offerer only recommends a method, you can reply by any method no less favourable to the offerer. Now that depends on the circumstances, but no less favourable probably means it's just as fast, that type of thing. And then if there's nothing at all about the method of communication, then acceptance can be communicated by a reasonable method. Okay. I'd say should know rather than must know. I don't think this will come up in your exam, but certainly it's an important point to make in practice. But remember, whoever makes the offer is the master of the offer. You can attach conditions to it, including the method of acceptance. Okay. And then we get on to electronic communication. Now, we've already looked at the postal rule, but the postal rule only applies to the post, the mail, the so-called snail mail. What about electronic communication? Well, with regard to offers, no problem. Offers, you've got, you need actual communication. But what about acceptance by electronic communication? Well, in Torres and Miles, says that postal rule does not apply to instantaneous communication. And I'm going to talk about email in a moment. Could you argue that email is not instantaneous? Because when you send an email, if you check your sent box, you find it doesn't pop up straight away. There's a gap, I don't know, 30 seconds, one minute. Is that instantaneous? <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't matter because as we'll see, the courts are very reluctant to extend the postal rule to anything and they have not extended it to email. So the postal rule will not apply to email. Uh, I've got a special PowerPoint coming up on email. Okay. Right. But then there are the, these other methods. Um, answering machines, telephone answering machines. Uh, when does acceptance actually take effect? Well, the House of Lords case of Brinkerbon and Stalic Stahl says and uh, Brinkerbong's on page 25, so is in Torres. So there's no universal rule in this area. The court will look at all the circumstances and decide whose fault it is that the message didn't get across. Now everybody, this is sort of common sense. If you choose a certain method of communication, whose fault is it that the message doesn't get through? Normally the sender. Normally the sender. Not always, but normally it is the sender. So the court will look to see whose fault it is that the message has not been received. Okay. Uh, the Brimnes is a special case that said, and a bit outdated now, telex message effective when received during office hours. So if you send a telex at midday, it will be received by the end of that particular day. But telex is a bit out of date. Uh, also mentioned sections 18 and 19 of the electronic transactions ordinance, uh, which is should know, not must know for our purposes, but again, uh, the, that piece of legislation does tell you exactly when the communication is effective. Okay. What about email? Now watch out for email, because I think I've put this in your assignment question one. So, is email instantaneous? No. Does the postal rule apply? No. 
So you need actual acceptance. Now there are some contrasting cases here. Uh, Chui and Digilan Moore was an interesting case from Singapore. And it dealt with uh, this situation of when acceptance was effective by email. The court said it's only when it's actually received. But what do you mean by received? Received by the machine or actually read by the recipient? The courts are not clear. Thomas and BPE solicitors seems to think it's only when it's actually read by the person it's addressed to. Okay, So watch out for that in the, your assignment question one. Take it both ways. If it means acceptance is effective as soon as it's received by the machine, your email machine, okay, well that's when it is. If not, it's only when it's actually read, and that's BPE and solicitors. BPE, Thomas and BPE solicitors, okay? So the court is still wrestling with this because we haven't had too many cases dealing with email acceptance, okay? But the first two bullet points are clear. Is email instantaneous? No, it's not. Is it, does the poster rule apply? No, it doesn't. So how does the court determine when email is effective? Well, it's usually when it's well, either received by the machine or actually read. The courts are a little bit undecided. Now, watch out for that. And they say, hang on, shouldn't the law be more certain? You could argue yes. <laughs> but um, sometimes there are areas of law in which the law is uncertain, a little bit confused. Okay, and so. It should be cleared up, yes. How do you clear up uncertainty? Either by a higher level court decision or by legislation. Okay. But the law at the moment is a little bit unclear on the exact time in which email is affected. It's either when it's received by the machine or when actually read by the person it's addressed to. Okay. And the case is on the screen are the ones that you uh, need to refer to in your assignment question. Okay. Now, be careful with your answers because a lot of students, after we work through an exam question, Mr. Greenwood, um, thank you for, normally in tutorial, I don't give you tutorials, but if I was in a tutorial, often in tutorials we, we cover past exam questions. And we go through, and then Mr. the students come and say, Mr. Greenwood, Thank you for going through that. Yeah, that was good. But what is the answer to question one? And I said, sorry, there is no answer. And I said, what? You're the teacher and you don't know the answer. I said, sorry, it's uncertain. Either because the information you're given in the question is not sufficient or the law is uncertain. Okay. By the way, in an exam question, you're only given a certain amount of facts and then you've got to come to give some advice. Okay. So quite often you don't know for sure, use your magic two-letter word, if, okay? A judge in a real case has access to far greater information. Uh, one of my judge friends, I went to see him in the high court once, and the, his clerk said, he's not here, he's not in his office, he's in court 36 of the high court, okay. He was in the, there was a whole staircase full of ring binders. That was evidence in a case he was hearing. And guess what? he made a decision which went on appeal. So if a judge in a real case having access to far, far greater information than you have in an exam question can get it wrong, don't worry about you in an exam question, okay? So quite often there is no black and white conclusion, okay? If you think one conclusion or one argument is stronger, by all means point it out, okay? So it's not a maths test. When I did my very first contract question. My answer was about six lines long. And I said, yeah, there's a contract between the two parties. Fail, because my first degree was a science degree. Now, no, no, you've got to think, remember, plaintiff, defendant. What's your argument? What's your argument? Think of the tree, okay? And then move on, okay? All right, um, let's have a quick 10-minute break. And after the break, then we'll come back and uh, finish off on... Uh, <coughs> agreement.
Okay, welcome back. Into the final stretch. Okay. Uh, by the way, the cases on the screen are not in your course manual. I gave them to you as a special gift to help you with your assignment questions. Okay. So it is an interesting area of law because we all use email, don't we? Uh, nobody can go on holiday anymore because <laughs> you always check your emails. I remember I was on holiday in Australia once and I, I'll send an exam paper to Mark because they, here it is, we've attached it to the email, can you mark it and send it? Oh my god, I thought I was on holiday. Anyway, there you go. I suppose the, the upside is when you go back to the office after holiday, there are no crises because you've handled them while you're away. When I was a uh, full-time solicitor, before email time, we have two weeks holiday, you dread going back into the office after two weeks away, because number one, your in tray would be piled up. Have I missed any deadline? Did I brief out my case? Oh. There, that was always a stressful time. Okay. All right, um, so acceptance, when is email effective? Good question. Uh, it, it is a, an evolving area of law, okay? But generally, acceptance must be actually communicated to the offeror. That's the general principle in Torres, okay? And certainly the postal rule will not apply to email. Okay. Will apply to text messages. Well, even, uh, well, uh, text messages are probably more instantaneous, but then again, uh, <coughs> do you read your text message straight away? Not, I, mean, I mean, we get very impatient these days, don't we? If you're sending a text message to somebody and they haven't replied within three minutes, why haven't you replied? <laughs> Are you ignoring me? Uh, anyway, doesn't matter. Communications, my goodness, what leaps and bounds have been made over the last 10, 15 years. Okay. And, and smartphones are absolutely brilliant. And you can download the relevant sections of the CECO, put it on your phone, and read it when you're going home on the Mass Torture Railway. Sorry, NTR. There's always somebody on the NTR who annoys me. I mean, it's coughing, sniffing, playing music without headphones. I don't, I was, and the only people who touch me are guys, the ladies. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't not be in. If you're going home tonight on the MTR, you might find me, but I'll be absolutely exhausted, so save your questions until next time, okay? All right. <clears throat> um, and indeed, if you've got questions, my suggestion is put it down in writing because this is good training for you. What is your question? What is the issue? Okay, and then give it to me, then I've got it there as a reminder and I can share it with the whole class, okay? Um, I don't welcome questions after class because number one, my brain's dead. And, okay, and if you've got a good question, let's share it with the whole class, bring it up next time. So normally I start off um, my lesson, I didn't tonight because we just met, I always have a little mantra, I say, are there any questions, queries, worries, anxieties, comments, suggestions? Okay? And I will finish up that way tonight. And I always say, I will have a number of suggestions. Number one, get to know your must-know cases, principles, and definitions. And number two, have a safe journey home. I haven't said that for a long time because most of my classes have been online. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. All right. Are there any questions now? Queries? Worries? Yes? So we spoke about letters and we spoke about emails. Yes? How about facts? Facts, same thing. Same thing. And Brinkabong is your case. The court will look at whose fault is it that the message didn't get across. Usually it's the fault of the sender, usually, okay? Because you choose that method, so you should accept, you know, whether the message gets through or not. But there is no universal rule in this area, that's brinkable. But the court usually see who's at fault, and usually it's the sender, because you know you haven't got through, perhaps. It's a little bit like in Torres. He knew he hadn't got through because the plane had thrown o uh, flown overhead. Denning then extended that to, um, Telex, uh, what's it, telegraph machines or something like that. Or when you've telephoned somebody, you know whether you got through or not, 
And if you don't it, you try again, right? So normally the onus is on the person sending the message. Sometimes it might be on the person receiving the message. So if you've got an answering machine and it doesn't work properly or something or other, that could be the fault of the receiver. But generally it's the fault of the sender, but there is no universal rule in this area. This is why it's a bit of a grey area. This is why I've given you email, because uh, Chui seems to say that the message is effective as soon as received by the machine. But Thomas K said, no, it has to be actually received by the other person. So Thomas is more Entore's type, uh, basically. And of course, instantaneous communication, you know, it's instantaneous. Why do we have the postal rule is probably the bigger question, because it's a major, it hasn't been overturned, the postal rule. It's still good law today. And by the way, you know what the word law means, everybody? That which is laid down. L-A-I-D is the law, L-A-W. And what is laid down, that's the law, until it's overturned. And then the new law is laid down. Okay. It's laid down how? Either in a case or by legislation. Okay. So this is why we got the expression, lay down the law. Okay. So if your wife says, you've got to be home by 10 p.m. tonight, she's laying down the law. I'm not married anymore. <laughs> no. So there you are. Okay. Uh, I've already covered the principle. Yeah, I've covered that. Okay. Termination of offers, everybody. So this is the next one leading up to our next must-know principle. After you go home tonight, you'll be glad you came because there will be three must-know principles. The Gibson principle, which you know and love already. The acceptance principle, which you know, and Torres, must be actually communicated unless it's a unilateral offer or the postal rule applies. One more principle, which has sort of, we've already covered a little bit with our, our volunteer, I'm sorry, Nate, uh, in the second row, Tommy. Tommy, right? Okay. In which Tommy uh, <coughs> very bravely volunteered to come out and pick up my bottle. I'll put it here so it reminds you. Okay. So, next one here is, how does an offer terminate? Good question. Uh, there's some must-know points here and some should-know points, okay? So, let's, I've got the must-know bits, I think in the next PowerPoint, have I got it? No, it's, that's the must-know bit, okay? Well, let's go back. How can an offer terminate? By being accepted. Bingo. Mama type. No problem. But you can also, and this is the second point, which is, I've got the separate PowerPoint. An offer may be withdrawn at any time before it is accepted. Right, Tommy? And the case you cite is pain and cave. Reminds me of my stomach. Pain, except it's Y-N-E. And cave, okay? <clears throat> Even if the promise is made to keep it open for a certain time, okay? Uh, you can say, I will keep my offer open until, you know, next Tuesday or whatever, but you can still withdraw it before next Tuesday unless the other person provides consideration to keep the offer open for that period of time. That's called an option contract, a separate contract, okay? And that's Rutledge and Grant, okay? But <coughs> how long is an offer open for? Good question. It will be open for a reasonable time if no deadline is set. If you set a deadline, then it will expire at the deadline. If you set no deadline, it will expire after a reasonable time. Well, what on earth is a reasonable time? Depends on the subject matter of the contract. If you're selling bananas, that's about what, three days? Actually, if you're selling avocados, that's impossible to tell. <laughs> Avocados are like cats, they have a mind of their own. They'll get right when they want to be. I've been dying to have an avocado because that's one thing I can eat. But anyway, not to worry. Uh, <clears throat> so, if you're selling something more permanent like a car, well, the offer will be open, I don't know, six months or three months, whatever. 
but actual communication is required. Byrne and Van Tienhoven is a must-know case. You cannot withdraw your offer without actual communication. Now here's a slightly complicated scenario. The communication of the withdrawal of the offer can come through a third party. But the third party must be a reliable source such that a reasonable person would be persuaded of its accuracy. It's a very unsatisfactory situation, but it's Dickinson and Dodds, because how do you know whether that person is a reliable source? I've met somebody in the pub, and he said after three, oh, yeah, yeah, I okay, sold it to someone else, mate. It's gone. Is that a reliable source? But that's Dickinson and Dodds. Uh, I'd say Dickinson and Dodds should know, okay? And it's a very unsatisfactory situation because how do you know whether the person is a reliable source? Uh, what about a seven-year-old child? Is that a reliable source? Anyway. Uh, but let's get on to the... And also you can terminate an offer by counter-offer. We know that. Delay, maybe. Okay. Death, which we needn't go into. Uh, <coughs> But now we get on to the last must-know principle for tonight. Must-know the withdrawal of an offer principle. An offer, and this comes up in your assignment question one, by the way, an offer may be terminated or withdrawn at any time before acceptance. Right, Tommy? Yes. But it must be actually communicated to the offeree. And that's Byrne and Van Tienhoff. So pain and cave... Byrne and Van Tienhoven must know cases. Put them on your list of must know cases. The with revocation or withdrawal of offer principle is a must know principle. Okay. Good. And uh, where are those covered? Uh, on page 30, I think, of your course manual, they cover that pretty well. I mean, your course manual is pretty good. It's just that I say it's about 100 pages too long. In particular, they deal with um, a vitiating element. What's a vitiating element? Uh, an element which makes a contract go bad. Okay. And the vitiating elements will we'll look at misrepresentation, duress, undue influence. Um, there's also a mistake. Uh, but there's also illegality. Now, illegality, everybody is only might like to know but for some reason your course manual devotes about 30 pages to it. It's all... If I was writing the manual, I'll put any of that in. Thank you. So I know it's a bit heavy. You'll notice the uh, contract course manual is a bit heavier than the taught one. The taught one's pretty good because it was written mainly by my colleague Hanif Mughal, who's a very handsome Indian lawyer. He looks like a movie star. Huh? Every time I see him, he's always so well dressed. Hello. Which movie have you been in lately? And, but Hannah's really good on tort law. Okay. Um, and um, he wrote the course manual initially. I think he did. It may, may have been amended later. But anyway, the tort manual, in my humble opinion, is a bit better than the contract manual. But the co contract manual is still pretty good. Don't. Anyway, okay, um, and then, yeah, Ramsgate Montefiore, that's on page 32. I've got that in the previous PowerPoint. All right, now, what I want to do with all of this, oh, lapse of time, yeah, that's Ramsgate Montefiore. A little bit more on uh, how long an offer is open for. It's not open forever. If there's a time limit, well, it'll expire after the time limit. If not, it will uh, lapse after a reasonable time. Ramsgate Montefiore on page 32. Um, and reasonable time depends on the nature of the subject matter of the contract. You've got that in your bundle, right? Is that in your bundle of PowerPoints? Yes, this one on the screen? Because I keep changing my, well, I keep adding to, try and make things clearer. Okay. As I say, my PowerPoints are good, but no such thing as a, perfect PowerPoint. I'm always working on them, okay, to try to make them more student-friendly. 
Okay, good. And then on to situations involving unilateral contracts, the so-called reward type issues. Okay, and you actually see these in Hong Kong. I mean, I often walk, hike safely now between Moi Wo and Discovery Bay, and every now and then somebody loses a dog. It's usually dogs. And the last dog that was lost was Clarence. So they had a big picture of Clarence, and they said, uh, Clarence was lost. And so anybody, please find Clarence, okay, etc., et cetera, please return, and we'll offer. So this is a unilateral contract. The person owning Clarence has they made the promise. The promise is to give you a reward if you return Clarence, okay? And the issue is going to be, is that notice an offer or an invitation to treat? And of course, it's a unilateral offer, because the person accepting the offer will accept by performing the required act. The big question is, what is the required act? Well, with Clarence, it's finding and returning Clarence to the owner. And of course, the notice would have had, you know, the telephone number uh, would have had... I love they had a nice photo of Clarence. That's <laughs> and that's not, that's not the first time people have lost dogs from Discovery Bay. I don't know why. Well, because when you leave Discovery Bay, you let them off the leash and they run all over the place anyway. By the way, on my walk, way back in 19, the late 1990s, I think, there was a British person staying in the Silver Mine Beach Hotel who went on that hike and disappeared. Nobody know what happened to him. Okay. Um, I wonder if he disappeared on purpose, or was there that little bit where I twisted my knee that if you fell down, nobody could find you? I, I don't know. But, so these are the reward type cases, normally returning something lost. Could be your smartphone, because people lose smartphones, don't you? Okay. Have you ever had a day in which you haven't heard somebody drop their smartphone? <laughs> but, but the phone's now much better, right? Then harder to break now. Oh my goodness, I remember I, I shattered my screen on my earlier. I went to Sham Chu Po, they got it, but then there's a place in Wan Chai which is really good. On All right. So that's the first issue in these unilateral type contracts is the notice or whatever it is, an offer or an invitation to treat. What happens if the notice says, anyone finding Clarence, we will give you a generous reward? Is that an offer? An indication? Yes. Willing to be bound, I suppose, willing to be bound, on certain terms. You could argue it's not an offer, because generous reward is not certain. Okay. Um, so that's an issue that might come up. Is that an offer, or is it just an invitation to treat? Okay. I mean, so when you find something, um, you, and you know who the owner is, you just return it, right? Normally you don't want any reward. Okay. Uh, how many times have you been on a bus in Hong Kong and left something on the bus? I left my purse on the bus once. Number 15 went all the way to the peak. And then they, and I called up the bus, yes, we've got... So that my purse went all the way up to the peak and I checked, it had all the cash in it. Somebody had handed it into the bus company and didn't want any reward. So that's, if I knew who they were, I'd probably give them Twenty dollars. No. <laughs> and then there was another lady. Uh, Chung, uh, there was a mother, husband, wife, and a child. And the child was acting up, and they got on a bus, and then they had to get off. And the mother left behind a whole bag on the seat. So you know, in the bus, minding your own business. Hello, what's this? So I handed it to the driver. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for a reward. I hope she got it because she would have had all the value. But anyway. So these are things, I mean, when you're walking along the streets of Hong Kong, do you walk with your head up in the air or do you walk with your eyes down? If you're with your eyes down, you might find something. Okay. All right, so that's it. So that's the first issue, everybody. The second issue would be acceptance. Now, with regard to acceptance, some cases here, uh, the Crown and Clark, and that's how you say it, by the way. R is Crown, V is and Clark. It's an Australian case the High Court of Australia. 
which is their court of final appeal. By the way, everybody, we're in Hong Kong. What is the uh, court of first instance in England called? High Court. What is the court of appeal in England called? Court of appeal. What is the court of final appeal in England? Supreme Court of the UK. Used to be the House of Lords. What is the court of first instance in Hong Kong called? Court of first instance. What's the court of appeal called? Court of appeal. What's the court of final appeal called? Court of final appeal. Well done, Hong Kong. <laughs> we make much more sense when it comes to courts. And the court of final appeal in Australia is the High Court of Australia in Canberra. Okay. All right. So, why is the capital of Australia Canberra? Good question. It used to be Melbourne, and then they had a fight with Sydney, and so they decided to settle for a place roughly halfway between. Yeah, there you are. And Canberra is Aboriginal for meeting place. There you are. I mean, got nothing to do with what we're talking about, except it's High Court of Australia, and they meet in Canberra. Uh, <clears throat> so, in the Crown and Clark, you think contract law might be boring? In Crown and Clark, information was given, uh, a reward was offered, sorry, for information given leading to the arrest of a murderer. Clark knew about the offer, gave the information, claimed the reward. But the High Court of Australia, and everybody thinks they got it wrong, said, no, 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 you only gave the information, Mr. Clark, because you were a suspect in the case yourself, and you only gave it to clear your own name. Now, everybody thinks that's wrong, because your motive should be irrelevant. As long as you know about the offer, that should be good enough, okay? So everybody thinks Crown and Clark is wrongly decided, and it's not binding in Hong Kong, it's only Australian. But in Williams and Carwardine, the English court said motive is irrelevant as long as the <coughs> act was done with knowledge of the reward. So that's, Williams and Carwardine makes more sense. That's why I've got CF, by the way. Have I got CF? Yeah. And in Gibson and Proctor, it was even more generous to the person giving information. All of these cases involve giving information leading to the arrest of a murderer. <laughs> I mean, police do this all the time, don't they? Yeah. A reward is offered for information leading to the arrest of the culprit. So in Gibbons and Proctor, information was provided before they knew about the reward, but then they found out about the offer before it got to the inspector in charge and an inspector pen. And the court said that's good enough, even though you gave the information before you knew, you then knew before it got to the officer in charge. So in both Williams and Carwardine and Gibbons and Proctor, the court said that the person giving the information had accepted the offer and could claim the reward. Clark is the one which everybody thinks is wrong. Okay. And revocation of a unilateral offer, good question. How do you revoke a bilateral contract? Well, you can withdraw it at any time before acceptance but actual communication is required. So remember, that's Payne and Cave, Byrne and Van Tienhoven. But what about a unilateral contract? Can the offerer withdraw a unilateral offer before the performance is completed? Well, this is the example of my friend in front, who's no longer here. He's gone to buy his goggles and his swimming trunks because he's going to swim across Hong Kong Harbour before 6 p.m. tomorrow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. uh, so remember, when it comes to these reward type issues, the big uh, acceptance need not be communicated to the offeror. Acceptance is by performing the required act. So two big questions. What is the required act? What is the required performance? And when does performance begin? Because once performance begins, the offeror cannot withdraw the offer. And that's a case of Errington and Errington. Errington's on page 27. And in Errington, a father promised, I think it was daughter and son-in-law, or was it son and daughter-in-law, I don't know. But the father promised a married couple 
the father owned the house and they lived in it. And they said, well, uh, providing you keep up the mortgage repayments, then the house will be yours. Okay? But then the father refused to uh, <coughs> comply with his offer. And so the, the couple started paying off the mortgage installments. That's the important thing. So they had started to perform the required act and the father could not withdraw the offer. So the young couple could claim the house from the father once they had completed the required act, which was paying off the mortgage instalments. Okay? All right. So that's Errington and Errington. By contrast, Luxor and Cooper is not actually in your course manual, uh, but Luxor and Cooper, it was a real estate agent, and he was promised a finder's fee if he found a property which the purchaser would actually purchase. Well, the real estate agent lined up a number of properties, the purchaser looked at them and decided not to buy any, and then said, I'm withdrawing my offer. Had the real estate agent started to perform the required act, the court said no, because the required act was to find a property which the purchaser would actually purchase. Okay? So, and how do you reconcile these two cases? Well, I think the answer is, in Luxor and Cooper, it was a commercial contract, and the finder's fee was quite generous. And so the court found that um, they had to actually find a property which the purchaser would buy. Okay? Um, but it's a good example of two contrasting cases. Okay? Um, and then the method of revocation. How do you withdraw a unilateral offer? Now, there is no binding case law in England or Hong Kong on this, but the leading case is a US case called Shuey in the US, and the Shuey says, if you're going to withdraw a unilateral offer, then you have to use a method which has the same degree of publicity or notoriety as the offer. So, <clears throat> if you say, put in a, a notice on a university notice board, advertising a reward for the return of a lost dog or whatever, you can withdraw that by simply taking down the notice or writing the words cancel across the notice. So that would be sufficient to withdraw or revoke the offer. Okay? All right. Another example, if the offer has come under the um, Apple Daily, can you withdraw it by advertising in the South China Morning Post? Probably not because okay. it have, doesn't reach the same audience, hasn't the same degree of publicity. Okay. So they're the issues that come up in unilateral contracts, and that's quite good because that helps us practice our must-know tools tonight. Definition of offer, definition of acceptance. Gibson principle, uh, <coughs> acceptance principle, revocation of offer principle. Okay. All right, um, here we go. Five more minutes and I'll let you go. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, everybody, you're actually in a good position to answer question one in your assignment. Your assignment involves a bilateral contract and the answer, and the, you start off by saying, whoever it is, would like to know if there's a contract between him or her and the other party. Well, I forget what their names are. Full stop. Next sentence. The court will look for essential elements in the formation of a contract. Colon. Number one, agreement. Number two, consideration, which we'll cover next time. Intention to create legal relations, etc. Full stop. Next sentence. The only element in issue in your assignment question one will be the element of agreement. Full stop. Next sentence. The court will analyze the existence of agreement in terms of offer and acceptance, unless there are exceptional circumstances. Colon. House of <coughs> Lords in Gibson and Manchester City Council. Full stop. Next sentence. There are no exceptional circumstances in your question. Full stop. Then you go through. Is there an offer? Question mark. Your first subheading. 
So you define offer and apply it to the question. Has the offer been communicated? Normally that's not so much an issue to the offeree, but is there acceptance? Define acceptance, apply it to the question. And then has it been communicated to the offeror or has it been the Tommy scenario? Has the offer been withdrawn before acceptance? Okay, And you go through and apply those principles. Okay, uh -huh. Remember the exceptions with revocation of an offer. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, that's it. Don't worry about it. Okay, so that's your blueprint for answering question one in the assignment. You can actually do it now, because the element of agreement is the only element at issue in that question. Okay. It does touch on email acceptance, but I've mentioned that before. Okay. And don't panic, there is no perfect answer to question one. My answer to questions by, to students, sorry, you say, well, what is the answer? I said, well, there is no answer, but then I go and say, did you identify the leading issue? Yes, good. Good. How did you identify it? By applying the definitions. For good. Okay. And did you apply it to the question, arguing both sides? Yes. Good. Well done. Okay. Um, there is an accurate. I'm not sure whether you can see this, but I'll put it up anyway. I'll put it in red. Here's how you answer exam questions. I, D, E, A. I know you can't see it, but. I D E A. Identify the issues. How do you identify the issues? By applying your definitions and explaining your principles. Okay, so that's the E, explaining principles. If you do that, will you pass the question? No. You then got to apply it to the question, arguing both sides. If you do that, first class honours. Okay? And if you do that, you will end up with the ideal answer. Okay. You might ask the question, hang on, what does L stand for, Mr. Greenwood? And I say, well, if you can identify the issues by using your definitions, explaining your principles, apply to the question, arguing both sides, then you will leave the exam hall laughing. <laughs> but do it quietly, don't be arrogant about it. All right, everybody, so I think that's pretty well it for tonight. We've done pretty well. We've covered that essential element of agreement. We will cover the next essential element of consideration next time we meet. There is a definition of consideration. It's simply reciprocal benefits and detriment. Reciprocal or mutual benefits and detriment, okay? Uh, but consideration, parts of consideration are quite easy, but other parts are not easy. Okay, I'll try and make it as clear as I can, okay? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. It's good to see face-to-face -face contact. Any questions, queries, worries, anxieties? Can't hear you, sorry. Uh, no, I don't give out my email address. If you want to contact me, contact me through space. The reason is, in the past, students have sort of abused that privilege. Okay, not that you would. Okay, if you got a question, put it in writing, give it to me here. Okay, right, good. Um, all right, and um, well, my suggestion, everybody, of course, know those definitions and principles, and my suggestion is have a safe journey home. Thank you. See you next Tuesday night. No.